So, I mean, the context of this discussion is, you know, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and you know, all the horrendous things, you know, the horrific war crimes and the suffering of civilians that we've all seen on the news over the past eight weeks or so. Um, often, you know, this conflict is seen, um, including by some on the left, as a national liberation struggle, you know, a struggle of Ukrainians against their Russian invaders. Um, and some people say, you know, why don't you want to arm the Ukrainians? You know, why don't you support sanctions for Russia, for example? You know, aren't you in favour of national liberation and you know, against imperialism? Um, actually, you know, in the Socialist Workers' Party, we haven't seen this um, primarily as a issue of national liberation. You know, we've seen it rather as an issue of inter-imperialist rivalry. So uh, you know, the Ukrainians are fighting in a kind of proxy war between the West and NATO um, and Russia. Uh, you know, we've argued that you know, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, calling for, for more arms will you know, involve NATO and draw them further into conflict and you know, ultimately strengthen Western imperialism. Uh, so we've taken a different view to some others. Um, you know, sometimes you know, we've said that the main enemy is at home. You know, what we have to argue for uh, in Britain and in the West is for de-escalation from our side, uh, but also ask, argue for de-escalation on the Russian side as well. Um, our comrades in Russia, you know, their main enemy is at home as well. You know, they oppose what the Russians are doing and you know, protest you know, against um, their, their own government's involvement in, in Ukraine uh, you know, at great risk to themselves. Uh, but, you know, socialists, you know, we are for national liberation and against imperialism. Um, and actually in, that, in the same part of the world, um, in the past, you know, we have called for national liberation. So, uh, you know, we actually you know, celebrated the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union and freedom for former Soviet states um, in Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, because we didn't see the Soviet Union as, as socialist, but, you know, we saw it as state capitalist. Um, we can discuss that more in the discussion if people, people want to. Uh, but the Bolsheviks in, in 1917 uh, you know, also showed you know, by example you know, the importance of national freedom, national liberation, uh, which is you know, what this meeting is mostly going to talk about, that, that kind of historical example. So um, I've got a few pictures, not many, but uh, hopefully this will help. So this is the Russian Empire in 1914, um, which was just before the First World War. Um, the Russian Empire was described by Lenin, um, the leaders of the 1917 revolution, as the prison house of nations. Uh, you know, 20 different nations were kept enslaved within this Russian Empire. Um, you can see on the map that you know, Finland is part of the Russian Empire. Um, as you go down, there's a big chunk of Poland, um, Minsk in what's now Belarus, um, Riga, uh, some, you know, Latvia, Lithuania, those are part of the empire. Further south, I mean, Ukraine. Um, this is most of kind of modern day Ukraine was part of the empire. And actually, Ukraine today, you know, extends a bit further west than this. You know, that's to do with the Second World War. Um, you know, you can see the Crimea down um, where it says Sevastopol in the Black Sea. It's all part of it. Um, where it says Caucasus Mountains, that is present day Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, and then further to the south and east, you've got what is currently um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and those, those countries of Central Asia as well. Um, this is another map on it. The colours in the, the key aren't very good, but just to kind of show you, give you a sense of the scale of the, of the Russian Empire. Uh, you know, it's all the way east until you get to the Pacific, you know, almost to, to Japan. Um, we've looked at the west, you know, it's as far north as, you know, the Arctic Circle at the top. Um, and, you know, as far south as the borders with um, Persia, what's now Iran and, and the north of India. So, yeah, absolutely huge. You know, by geographic area, it's, you know, the biggest, um, you know, empire of the time. Yeah, not biggest by population, but in terms of empire, certainly. Um, it's absolutely enormous and you know as I said many different peoples within it um, and people like ethnic Russians are actually a minority of the population only 43 percent of the population but despite that you know everyone had to practice Russian Orthodox um, Christianity it's like the state religion and you know Russian was the sole language everyone had to speak um, people of the um, 
the south and the east peoples of the, the kind of the Volga and the Caucasus and Central Asia were particularly oppressed um, and they were deprived of some of their best land and you know that went to the Kulaks kind of wealthy Russian peasants and yeah because of this like anti-imperialism was a central issue for for Russian Marxists um, so in you know, 1903 there was a congress of Russian Marxists that adopted a position that said that every nation in Russia should have the right to self-determination and to regional self-rule and to use its own languages and you know, to practice their own languages in schools and social institutions and things. Uh, but there was a, a debate, um, you know, quite a sharp debate among Marxists about some of these issues. Um, so for example, around Polish independence. So there was you know, a drive for a separate Polish state um, that was you know, free from domination from the Russian Empire and from the Prussian em uh, from Prussia and from the Austro-Hungarian empires. Uh, but that kind of independence movement in Poland was led by the country's middle classes. And so, you know, Polish-born revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg argued that that was a kind of a middle class reactionary movement that socialists shouldn't support. And that you know, supporting um, you know, Polish kind of nationalism would set Polish workers apart from, from Russian workers. Uh, Lenin took a, a different view, said that actually you know, they should support Polish independence struggles, but only because national liberation struggles could then act as a kind of step towards revolutionary consciousness. Um, and that they could be, you know, they would need to be part of a kind of wider struggle against imperialism. Um, so, and also that, you know, kind of what was key to Lenin's arguments was that Russian workers as well should also take up the demands of national liberation for countries like Poland. So you know, the poorest people in the, the anti-colonial movement um, should you know, come to see the Russian workers as their natural allies because the Russian workers should, should support them. Um, similarly, kind of, you know, Marx and Engels in their day in the 19th century said that British workers um, should support Irish freedom and, and Irish independence when you know, Ireland was a, a colony of, of Britain at the time. And so you know, what you had was kind of yeah, the Bolsheviks starting to develop uh, anti-imperialist views and becoming kind of the first Marxist current to recognise the importance of anti-colonial movements and liberation struggles taking place in, in colonies around the world. Uh, clearly, you know, not just in the Russian Empire, but also you know, Lenin supported Irish independence as well. You know, he celebrated the 1916 Easter Rising um, within Ireland. Um, and, yeah, the Bolshevik position kind of changed throughout its its history. Um, it was also quite different from from Stalin's kind of idea of nationalism. So Stalin in 1913 described defined nationalism as you what know, well, he defined a nation as something that's historically constituted stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. So. You know, actually, some of these kind of areas of the Caucasus and um, Kazakhstan and um, places like that, you know, they wouldn't really meet Stalin's criteria for, for nations at this point. That kind of national consciousness hadn't really started to assert itself until, uh, until much later on in these parts of the world. Um, so what, what Lenin said was that, you know, it's not just about national culture. He said that uh, national liberation implies exclusively the right to independence in the political sense. Um, you know, fight against all national oppression, yes, certainly. Fight for any kind of national development, for national culture in general, certainly not. So it's not, it's more about a political demand for independence. It's less about some kind of notion of a shared and fixed culture that everyone within a nation has to share and that um, you know, has to form the, the basis of, of nationalism. Um, all of these questions were thrown into relief um, during the 1917 revolution. Um, and, you know, in itself, it's a huge achievement to instigate a socialist revolution uh, in a country of this, this vast size. And that's something that's not been achieved before um, you know, or since. Uh, you know, people were taking over factories, you know, workers were kicking out the bosses, you know, running the factories um, you know, in elected Soviets land was taken from landlords and you know transferred quite quickly into the hands of, of millions of peasants across russia and you know the huge changes in the way people lived uh you know, sexism and homophobia you know challenged uh, abortion became legal you could have divorce on demand people's daily lives changed dramatically so in um 
Petrograd, you know, St. Petersburg now, you know, 90% of people at one point, uh, you know, ate their meals communally rather than eating them, you know, cooking and eating separately. Uh, so there's this kind of, you know, huge changes in you know, communal ways of living. Um, it's much more you can read about the Russian Revolution in general. Um, it's also a huge challenge to kind of cement the gains of the revolution across such a huge territory. Um, in terms of national liberation, uh, you know, really early on, um, they immediately recognised the right of national minorities. So, uh, yeah, 15th of November 1917, which is just a week after the, the October Revolution, which you know, actually took place in November. Um, but, um, you know, a week later, um, the Soviet government decreed the equality and sovereignty of the peoples of Russia and the right of these peoples to self-determination, uh, including to independence. So, you know, Ukrainians, you know, Finland, Armenia, plenty of other oppressed nations uh, were given the right to succeed from the Russian Empire. Uh, you know, despite the problems that this probably would have caused for the Russians um, in that revolutionary situation. Um, you, know, the, you know, it seems kind of, you know, contradictory, I think, sometimes that they, you know, we want internationalism, don't we? We want all workers around the world to be united and to see their common goals. So why, you know, argue for breaking up this big um, empire into lots of separate different nations? It seems kind of counterintuitive and counterproductive. But what actually Lenin and the Bolsheviks wanted was a political unification of the different, different states and you know, unity among all the different working people of different nationalities. But on the basis of them freely choosing to be part of, um, part of the Federation, and choosing to be part of the Federation on the basis of, um, of equality and you know, equal kind of status, rather than being oppressed as part of this big, uh, big empire. Um, it's kind of, you know, letting all these nations succeed if they wanted to was also kind of another reason why, why Vladimir Putin hates the Russian Revolution and doesn't kind of support the legacy of the Russian Revolution. Because, you know, for people like him, this is you know, voluntarily kind of um, succeeding your empire. It's yeah, the opposite of what someone like Putin would want to do. It's kind of, you know, defeatist kind of strategy um, for him. And so in practice, kind of what happened was that the Soviet government invited each nation within Russia to hold a Congress to decide, you know, what they were going to do, um, you know, if they wanted to participate in the kind of federal structure, um, which is called the, the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic at the time. Um, they said that you know, people could, uh, in these different regions, could be autonomous, they could have their own schools, um, their own courts, administrations, and their own political and cultural institutions. Uh, you know, it gave them all the rights to use their minority languages that they hadn't had before in, you know, in all spheres of activity. Um, they created five independent states, um, which included Poland and Finland, and then another 17 autonomous republics and regions throughout this, um, what had been the empire. Uh, they put, uh, Bolsheviks put a lot of emphasis on, on education um, in, in general, but um, particularly for people from the uh, previously kind of oppressed minority regions. And they even kind of like devised alphabets for people to, to use, encouraged literacy, uh, you know, wrote dictionaries in different languages um, for people to, to learn from. Uh, People from these other nationalities were recruited into government administrative bodies and they attended universities as well. Uh, you know, and, you know, it was kind of, um, you know, actually sort of assisted to, to, to be given, given work in, in, in administration and, uh, and to given university places that so they actually sort of um, joined universities in proportion to their population. Um, I think it's particularly interesting to look at the situation for Muslims. Um, so at the time of the Ref revolution, um, 16 million Muslims in, in the Russian Empire, it's about 10% of the population, uh, you know, mostly kind of concentrated in the, in the south and east. And you know, a lot of them have suffered huge oppression um, under, under Tsar Nicholas II. And so they had these you know, demands for equality and liberation, and um, also for, for religious freedom that they hadn't enjoyed before a national right. So Lenin and the, the Bolsheviks also made granting their rights a um, priority as well. 
Um, and lots of Muslims join the Bolsheviks as well. I've got a picture, I think, of um, Muslim fighters um, joining the, the, the Red Army in, in 1918. Um, a lot of them didn't see the kind of contradiction between being a Bolshevik and being a Muslim, even though I think we tend to think now that, uh, you know, if you want to be a Marxist, you have to be, be an atheist. That's, you know, not, not the case. Um, it wasn't the case in, uh, in, during the Russian Revolution. And they actually achieved a lot of religious freedom. So, um, you know, Friday, which is you know, the holy day of the week for Muslims, of course, um, was declared a day of rest in Central Asia. Uh, you know, Islamic monuments and books and objects that have been taken away from people um, by the Tsars were returned uh, to the mosques. Um, people were allowed to practice Sharia law. Um, there's a, uh, in 1921, there's kind of parallel Islamic court um, established in accordance with Sharia. So people you were know, given the choice between uh, using Sharia courts or, or kind of Bolshevik courts, I think. Um, Oh, things like um, you know, sentencing to people to death by stoning and cutting off hands and things like that were, were, were forbidden after the revolution. Uh, there was a really important congress called, um, this is an image from it, um, the, the first congress of the peoples of the East in 1920 in um, Baku in uh, what's now Azerbaijan. Uh, this is an image of um, Alexandra Kollontai, one of the women leaders of the Russian revolution, attending that congress with uh, obviously women from that that region and from lots of other regions, I would, I would imagine. This was Congress that called for uh, a war against Russia, well, a holy war actually against Western imperialism and for the ending of all forms of oppression um, of one people by another and you know, all forms of exploitation. Um, it was, so it's a kind of you know, revolutionary demand for an end to colonialism around the world. Um, as you can see from this picture, there's lots of women at this Congress and and they discussed demands of Muslim women. Uh, one of the key demands for Muslim women was opposition to um, polygyny, so you know, one man having more than one wife, uh, something that Muslim women wanted to, to oppose um, themselves. Uh, there was a, an all Russian Muslim Congress quite early, actually, even before the revolution, May 1917, where this was a, a key demand um, among the, the Muslims debating there. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the men wanted to kind of slowly reform this this practice, uh, but you know, the women that were, were there said, you yeah, know, no, we need to have an yeah, immediate ban of um, the polygyny and um, the wearing of the veil, and you know, what Muslim women do or don't wear on their heads was not a kind of key issue of debate in these conferences. It wasn't seen as um, a kind of you know major issue that people were that bothered about, and um, I think. Um, <clears throat> and people like like Colin Ty pictured there, and um, another leading Bolshevik woman, Inessa Armand, went and travelled uh, around um, around these parts of the you know the former empire. You know, often wearing the veil themselves, so they could you know speak more easily to to Muslim women and and work alongside Muslim women. They, they ran education programs. Um, for something called the Zenot Del, the Muslim, um, you know, the women's rights organization, talk to women about their concerns and uh, you know, try to organize uh, against sexism around, um, around the, the sort of former empire. Um, what's really important is that revolutionaries from these minority nationalities often played a leading role in carrying out a lot of these policies and pushing for the policies of the Bolsheviks. They didn't just have it enforced um, upon them. Uh, what um, Leon Trotsky, another Bolshevik uh, leader of the revolution, said at the time was that what characterizes Bolshevism on the national question is that it, in, in its attitude towards oppressed nations, even the most backward, it considers them not only the objects, but also the subjects of politics. Uh, it's just another picture from the, the Baku conference in, in 1920 at the Peoples of the East. Um, the case of Ukraine and the Bolsheviks is extremely complicated. Um, Ukraine has been a battleground for various different imperialisms throughout much of its history. Um, immediately after the revolution, it uh, briefly became the Ukrainian People's Republic um, in 1917. There's a, it had its own kind of Bolshevik uprising in um, Kiev or Kyiv um, around the time of the Russian Revolution. And, you know, when the Bolsheviks proclaimed that countries could succeed, it became an autonomous region, but with ties 
to Russia. And there were some initial kind of attempts to promote Ukrainian language and you know, Ukrainian culture after the revolution. Uh, unfortunately, it was very short lived. And um, yeah, as far as I could tell, I mean, it had, it had its own civil war. Yeah, it was a civil war um, throughout Russia. But um, you know, they had their own kind of version of the civil war, you know, the, right, the whites versus the Red Army. And, and it was invaded by the Russian Red Army, um, which you know, doesn't necessarily kind of show the Bolsheviks in the best light. It might have been that it was something that they were forced to do or it might have been simply, simply a mistake. But kind of sadly, because of the way that played out, uh, you know, Bolshevism was seen as a kind of as an outside force that imposed itself on Ukraine by, by lots of Ukrainians, uh, even though there were you know, Ukrainian Bolshevik revolutionaries, uh, you know, women like Evgenia Bosch, very interesting kind of women leader, and you know, the miners of the Donbass had very kind of radical traditions, um, and they, they still did throughout the, and probably still do, you know, throughout the 20th century, and, you know, often, you know, supported the Bolsheviks. Uh, but it ended with um, you know, Ukraine breaking from Russia and looking to Germany instead. Uh, the RADA, which was the kind of Ukrainian uh, you know, government, you know, preferred to ally itself with Germany and later on with England and, and France rather than Bolshevik Russia. And uh, you know, Germany actually came in and kind of detached Ukraine from, from the revolution and promised it independence. Uh, in practice, this was kind of a land grab by Germany, uh, you know, occupation by Germany, uh, you know, designed to kind of uh, destabilize the, the Russian Revolution and damage it and, uh, and you know, try and destroy it. Um, so there was, you know, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk between Russia and Germany in March 1918, uh, which pulled Russia out of the, you know, the First World War, we're talking about the end of the First World War here, um, but also provided military support from Germany and Austro-Hungary to, to Ukraine and then remove the Bolsheviks from, from Ukraine. Um, I'll just try and quickly talk about Stalinism. Because um, I think, you know, just, just to say that, that Stalinism and the counter-revolution was very, in very sharp contrast to the ideals of Lenin. And you know, it was based on taking back a lot of that territory that, um, that, that you know, the Bolsheviks had, had, had given up. Um, you know, subjecting all these territories to bureaucratic centralism, uh, the return of kind of greater Russian chauvinism, imposing their language and culture on, on other people, hostility to, to minority rights, uh, turned Ukraine into just a kind of source of food and, and natural resources with, uh, you know, with horrendous consequences. There was a massive famine in, in Ukraine um, called the Holodomor, where, where millions of Ukrainians died under under Stalinism and you know, forced collectivization of farming uh, and you know it gets even worse when they sign a deal with Hitler in, in 1939 uh, you know allows uh, you know, allows Hitler to invade Poland and, and the Russians uh, take over Ukraine and extend Ukraine westwards but of course and uh, you know you then get get Nazis marching into Ukraine and uh, you know, killing millions of people including Ukrainian Jewish people and you know, as, they, as they march on the way to, towards Russia. Um, again, I don't have time to go into it in, in much detail, but I think it's also important to note as well that the ideas of national liberation um, from, the, from the Russian Revolution actually spread to other places around, around the world and inspired anti-colonial movements. So, uh, you know, across Africa, this... Um, you know, the Russian Revolution was very inspirational and in India there was a Communist Party formed in 1920. Uh, in Ireland there were strikes and occupations after, after 1917. You know, it was something that called itself the Limerick Soviet in, in Ireland. Uh, so for people that were you know, colonised around the world, they were very inspired by the Russian Revolution and it really scared the imperialists as well. And you know, the British government were very worried about the Russian Revolution. They actually tried to stop people getting to that conference in Baku um, in 1920 by, um, you know, attacking people, attacking the delegates on their journeys to the conference and uh, patrolling the, the Black Sea and things, trying to stop them get, get in there. 
Um, so kind of in conclusion, I think, yeah, it's socialists were, you know, we're for national liberation, we're against imperialism, uh, you know, we're for you know, struggles of the Palestinians against Israeli colonization, you know, we're still for a united Ireland, we support Kurdish struggle against, against oppression, and, you know, of course, yeah, independence for you know, India and large parts of Africa and the Caribbean, and uh, you know, just what we call the global south today after the Second World War, you know, was a good thing. Um, you know, we support those kind of national struggles against imperialism and against colonization. Uh, so those kind of nationalisms, I think you'd see quite differently from kind of British nationalism or, you know, French nationalism or German nationalism, which, which we don't support. If there was ever anything progressive about those kind of nationalisms, then there isn't any more. Um, um, yeah, I've been asked to finish. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, when we, 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 we support anti-imperialist resistance. I think it's important also, uh, it's kind of the last point, um, that you know, what kind of anti-imperialist resistance do, you, do we support? It, you know, it should be working class based anti-imperialism, you know, methods of mass strikes and protests and, you know, that kind of resistance rather than the kind of anti-imperialism of, of the sort of bourgeois nationalists. Uh, so, you know, with you know, Indian independence, you know, Lenin and the Bolsheviks didn't want the workers' movement in India to just ally itself and just dissolve itself into the Congress. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of sort of relevant when it looks to, you know, should we support someone like, like Zelensky, quite a right-wing nationalist against, against Russian invasion? Um, but, yeah, that's kind of the, the, yeah, the final point I'll, I'll make, I think. Thank you very much, Camilla. You made, really, um, you made some really important questions about um, national liberation struggles and you know, whether they can act as a kind of stepping stone or whether they can inspire you know, demands that actually you know, go further than just national independence. I think that's you know, the really key question, isn't it? Because um, you know, lots of these kind of national independence struggles that we've seen um, in the you know, 19th and 20th century and and so on you've had you know there was a thing about you know Ghana on the on the radio recently I think you know, had you know independence for Ghana of course you know we, we should support that you ended up with a system where you know, actually they're running the same the same kind of capitalist state uh, that they had under under British colonialism um, uh, unfortunately I think that's you know a kind of key issue that we had to sort of grapple with that you know what went wrong with all these kind of national liberation movements or yeah yeah many of them um I, I think part of that is about the you know the Russian revolution itself as well and how uh although you know the Russian revolution was very inspiring to national liberation movements uh by the you know late 1920s onwards what they were you know looking for to was actually you know the Soviet Union and to and to Stalinism rather than the tradition of, of Lenin and the Bolsheviks and that was um yeah that meant that a lot of the it's kind of um, you know African independence movements um well it was yeah good that they would look to the Soviet Union but actually they had quite a kind of a nationalist and um quite kind of stagist approach to things where you start off with national independence and then national you know it, workers revolution could happen at some point down down the line because it because it never happens um but i think in all of these kind of movements that people are talking about i think and ireland is a really good example of it there are you know there are nationalist uh, you know middle class leaders of it but also uh you know more radical forces within that um, liberation national liberation movement as well uh, but, you know sometimes as in the case of ireland are completely you know shocking to the to the sort of self-declared leader of the thing um it kind of made me think of about, about palestine as well i think you know the sort of hamas and the, the sort of mainstream leadership of um the palestinian state uh you know can sort of you know have quite middle class conservative demands sometimes but i think you know, a lot of uh you know, palestinian workers and young palestinians want to go much much further than that in terms of winning uh you know, how, how you win liberation for palestine and of course you know international solidarity is absolutely key as well that you know as lenin said you know in in the case of poland like yeah the polish 
independent movement had to also win the support of of Russian workers. I, you know, that's that's really key to it. That there's there's solidarity from the, the, the colonialist countries towards these these movements as as well. Um, yeah, I agree with what people have said uh, about Scotland. Uh, yeah, Scotland isn't an oppressed nation, oppressed by the English. Uh, yeah, during colonial times, uh, yeah, Scotland played its, its role as a coloniser of other parts of the world um, as part of British colonialism, just as, um, just as England and Wales did. Um, it's not a kind of, you know, we don't really see it as a national liberation struggle, but you know, we, we said, um, you know, we want, we're, we're yes to independence, no to nationalism, essentially, didn't we? Uh, you know, we do want independence. We want you know the break up of the British state, as as people have said. But I think yeah, you know, we also need to talk about what kind of independence would that be um, from from the United Kingdom? And uh, you know, we want you know independence, you know, independent Scotland that welcomes refugees. Uh, yeah, it'd be much better than what it is at the moment in the in the UK, of course. Uh, you know, we want them to you know, embrace, you know, renewable energy and, you know, take seriously the climate crisis rather than, uh, you know, being reliant on North Sea oil and in investing in that. Um, I don't know whether um, they would get rid of the anti-union laws. I think that is, again, another demand that we would want for, for an independent Scotland, certainly. Uh, yeah, it's very difficult to try and um, call a strike at the moment uh, in the UK with these these laws about, about turnout and ballot period and things that we all have to to deal with but yeah I won't go into that in, in detail. Um, so Ukraine, I think people have spoke well on, on Ukraine and been very clear about it. Um, you know, I agree with the analysis that Martin Martin put about how you know we're we're for the defeat of Russia but uh, you know it matters how how Russia is defeated. Um, I think yeah people have talked about kind of, is there a peace movement um, any more in Ukraine. Obviously, it's quite hard to get information about what's going on. We have seen protests at various points um, of ordinary Ukrainians, you know, not people armed and you know, trying to militarily defeat the Russians, but trying to go and protest and you know, sometimes even kind of engage and fraternise with the, with the Russian troops. And there have also been some kind of rumours of mutinies among, among Russians. Um, uh, which would be incredibly important um, if it does happen. Uh, and even I think, you know, some comrades were telling me that there have been cases of Russian um, rank and file troops turning on their officers as well, which, you know, definitely something they would want to see more of. But that's, you know, that's what we look to is ordinary Ukrainians, um, not, you know, not armed by, by NATO, but ordinary Ukrainians fraternising with, with Russians. Uh, you know, we hope for, for for the Russian troops to, to mutiny and refuse to fight. Um, we looked at the anti-war movement in Russia and you also looked at you know, the anti-movement here in, in Britain as well and other places in the West to try, try and call for de-escalation um, from our own, our own side. It's, yeah, it's, as I said, it's, it's difficult to see um, what is happening at the moment um, uh, in Ukraine, but there are small examples of the kind of things that, um, that we could look to um, instead of uh, you know just arming the Ukrainians and and you know strengthening the role of, of NATO in the region. I think um, it's difficult in the unions, isn't it? It's really difficult to have these these arguments, and you know we weren't always with these arguments at the moment. Um, but I think you know although yeah, it's much easier to win the arguments around all refugees and. Uh, well, you know, I think that is, is a point that we should make, though, you know, we're for Ukrainian refugees welcome, but, you know, all refugees, wherever, wherever they're from, if they're from Afghanistan or, or Libya or Syria as well, should be all refugees welcome. So you know, we argue that uh, not too difficult within a union like the PCS, but I don't think we, you know, conduct the argument also um, about NATO, which is, you know, the more difficult argument about, uh, you know, whether to, to arm them. And, um yeah, we won't, we won't necessarily you know, win a motion at a PCS conference on that. I think we should try and argue it, and I think we will win a layer of people. You know, the the teachers' union conference was was just last week, and there was you know a debate, and it seemed like actually you know a lot of the people on the floor of the conference were you know won over to our arguments, and then when other people came and opposed us, they were won that way. So there's a lot of people that are still making their mind up about 
what they think and haven't necessarily heard our arguments yet and you know are, are winnable i think you know although the the motion you know we didn't ultimately win that motion uh, you know a large minority of people on the conference floor you know, voted with us on that at the at the, um, the teachers union conference the neu similar in, in ucu my union which is um, university and colleges union there's you know we can try and build a kind of you know there's us and there's a there's few people that um, agree with us on this and that will sign statements in agreement um with what we say though we're not the the minor uh, we're not the majority at the moment but uh, yeah things could change in terms of that so um that's what we're kind of kind of uh, you know arguing at the moment so i think i'll, I'll sort of you know end, end on that point but um uh, it's, it's good to, to to see people and i hope you know if people have been interested in the arguments um about what, what we've said today and want to want to get involved and you know do come to, come to more of these meetings and you know do consider also joining the socialist workers party you know we need more people um joining the revolutionary organization and uh, you know talking about these ideas of, of revolution and talking about the you know the history of the russian revolution and, and what it can show today <laughs>